here's some idioms. that These are just a few idioms that are related to the leg. Walking my legs off. You're pulling my leg. Go break a leg. He has a hollow leg. What does that mean? He what? He, he eats too much. He's always eating. He has a hollow leg. Get a leg up. All right, these are just a few idioms. I mean, there are millions of them. We use them all the time and don't even know it. Every language and every culture has an idiom. In Mexico, a novel was written, and one passage within that novel, if I translate it into English, it says that the farmer went out into the field and hung up his tennis shoes. Now, what's going through your mind? What are you seeing? What? They're going to get wet. Okay, I, in my mind, I see this maybe a pole or something out in the middle of the field, and he takes his tennis shoe off and sets it up on the pole. He hangs up his tennis shoes. Does that make any sense to us? No? And in the context of the novel, by the way, there, it doesn't make any sense either. The problem is, is it's an idiom, a Mexican idiom that makes no sense in English, but if I translate it with a, an equivalent Hebrew or English idiom, I would say he went, the farmer went out into the field and kicked the bucket. Okay, did he really kick a bucket? He died. Okay, hang up his tennis shoes means he died. So you have to be really careful. There was one man who went to Japan who was giving a, a lecture to some businessmen, and he just happened to use an idiom that his, his, his wife laughed her head off. And he expected, because of the way he said it, he expected some roaring laughter. Instead, they were like horrified, you know, because the translator didn't understand the idiom and literally translated it. Do we have this problem in the biblical text? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of idioms in there. The translators do their best to translate them for And usually you see the idiom translated out with the understanding put back in, but not always. 1 Samuel 20, verse 34, And Jonathan rose from the table with a nose on fire. Yeah, anger. But literally, it's his nose was on fire. That's what it says. But, but it means to be angry. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Now, in the first one we just looked at, the nose on fire, usually in your translation, well, always in your translation, you see he got up from the table with a fiery anger or fierce anger. They translate the idiom so that you understand the text. But usually in the poetic passages, like in Psalms and Proverbs, they leave them in. And you're left with to try and figure this out. What are the gates? What are these ancient doors? What are the gates? Do gates really have a head that lifts up? No. You have to understand the, the Hebrew culture in the cities. They had a wall around the city. And there were gates to get into the city. Where did the judges judge people? At the gates. So a gate is an idiom for the judges. So now we can translate this, lift up your heads, O judges. In fact, you see Lot. Where was Lot at when the people came? He was at the gate. What was Lot? A judge. Here are just a few of the Hebrew idioms we see in the text. Stretch the tent. We talked about that yesterday. That means to have more children. His face fell as he sat. Heart lifted up, proud. Knew no quiet in the belly, greedy. These are Most of these, I think, are actually translated out. You don't see them in your translations. Open the ear to inform someone. The right hand means mighty. Hide the face to refuse to answer. And a hard forehead, stubborn. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. What is this? I'm looking for one word here. What is this? Hebrew? Poetry. It's saying one thing two different ways. The righteous one is to life, and the one pursuing evil is to death. Again, Hebrew poetry, just using the opposites. Instead of saying one thing two different ways, you say two different opposites together. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your Torah is within my heart. What is the will of God? Torah. Torah literally means teachings. I desire to do your will is parallel with your Torah is within my heart. Desire and heart are parallel. Will and Torah are parallel. If we understand Hebrew poetry and, and this concept of parallelisms, it will really help us to ha understand words. Because if two words are parallel together, we know they're similar in meaning or they're opposite in meaning.
In English, I would normally write, the artist painted the canvas. We would never say, the painter painted the painting. Is that, is that good English? That's pretty poor, isn't it? It's poor Greek, too. But Hebrew loves it. We would say, the artist fainted from the injury. In Hebrew, you would say, the painter fainted from the pain. It's not rhyming like we think of rhyming. It's word puns, using words that sound alike. Very common in Hebrew. Very common in the New Testament. When you take the Greek, translate it into Hebrew, you see these word puns all over the place. But a sheet one, two, and the earth was without form and void in Hebrew. Veha ararets, haipa toho vavoho. Notice the similarity in sound. Hebrew loves that. They just love it. You find it all over the place. Now, the next one is uh, Better Sheet 614. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. That's English translation. In the Hebrew, notice, look, as I read this, look at the similarity of sounds in the different colors. Ase lecha tevat atse gopher. Kinim ta'ase et ha teva vechafar ta'ota mi bayit o mechutz ba kofer. Notice the similarity in sound. There's three different reoccurring sounds within that. All right, now what we've covered is inspiration. We've, we've kind of given an overview of how the Hebrews think, how they wrote the original text, so that we have a perspective of who they were in their culture. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how that text was preserved over time and what may have happened to it through its processes of, of preservation. This is just some examples of copies of the Hebrew Tanakh. This is the Masoretic text or the Codex Leningrad. This is the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritans were a group of people in the land of Israel. They kind of remained independent from the Jews. But their Torah scrolls today are still in Paleo-Hebrew. This is called the Abisha scroll. They say it was this, this scroll right here, this scroll, the original, was written by Abisha, the son of Aaron. I, I don't believe that, but that's what they say. And their Samaritan Pentateuch, or their Torah, is quite different from the Jewish one. There are a lot of differences. For example, in in the, in the Jewish Torah, it says that the temple will be in Jerusalem. In the Samaritan text, it's in Mount Gezerim, which is where they still have Pesach and still do sacrifices there. But anyway, this is the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's in Hebrew, in Paleo-Hebrew. And it is a source to help with textual criticism. Even though there's differences in it and there's errors and there's messings going on in there, it still is a help in textual criticism. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we've talked a lot about those. They're in Hebrew. They're also a resource for textual criticism for looking at older versions of the Hebrew Tanakh. 